Good afternoon, everybody from the Biocommunications Association. This is Biocom 2021, the virtual edition, and we are in July. And so we would like to introduce our speaker for today is Jamie Hayden, Managing Director of Imaging and Shared Resources at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And this is the second part of his 3D um, confocal microscope workshop, and it's going to be 3D acquisition and rendering. So we welcome Jamie and thank him for his service to the BCA and for uh, this major two-part presentation. So take it away, Jamie. Okay, thank you, Adam. And everybody, if you don't have your mics muted, please mute them now so we don't have that coming in. Um, so thanks everybody for uh, joining in. If you missed the first part of the uh, discussion a month ago when we were doing the initial confocal part of this, uh, that first talk was about acquiring a good 2D sharp image in fluorescence using the confocal. What we're gonna do today is build on that. So I'm going to assume that you either were here in person uh, when I did this the last time, or you were able to watch the recording, which is currently on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, and I'm also expecting that you probably hopefully watched the training videos to go along with it. All of this does build on, like I said, it does build on each other. So we're gonna kind of go from where we left off last time and continue. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna actually do is I'm gonna share my screen here. And we're going to go to moving a few things around. We're actually going to start off with a traditional little PowerPoint thing here. Um, so the last time when we did this, we were working with the Leica SP5 laser scanning confocal microscope. This was the system that we were using the last time. And as you can see, it's got this big chamber around an inverted microscope and the screen off to the right and all that. Um, what we're using this time is a little different. We're taking an upgrade here from the SP5 and we're moving across the hall to the SP8. So this is uh, a couple of years later than the SP5 when it came out. And so of course it has some new upgrades that are particularly useful for doing uh, live uh, cell work. And, and that was one of the reasons that we got it. Uh, on the surface, it looks very similar to the other one, but you'll notice a couple of major features. And probably the first thing you notice is there's no big box around it. And that's because instead of the box, we have on the stage this tiny little incubation stage top incubator. Uh, and in here, we put our little dish, as you can see there, that little um, pink colored dish in the middle there. Into this dish, uh, you have a mixed CO2, 5% CO2 uh, coming in. So that keeps the atmosphere at the proper levels. There is water in there to keep the humidity up. Uh, and uh, the temperature is controlled uh, both on the surface of, of that as well as underneath. And the objective is also heated. So with all of those major touch points heated, you're not going to really get much of a heat sink going on. So that helps mitigate any uh, uh, Z drift, if you remember me talking about that last time. So that's one of the big things. The other thing that this has is something called adaptive focus control. And so if we do get any Z drift, what adaptive focus control or AFC does is actually brings it back to the point that it was. So it's constantly measuring, here I am, here I am. And if you start to drift, it brings you back before it takes the next image. So that's very useful. This system also has a white light laser. With the last system, we had nine individual laser lines. With this one, I have 201 because the White light will go from 470 nanometer excitation up to 670 nanometers, uh, plus a 405 laser for doing um, DAPI type things as well. This also has an optical stage. So if you remember the last time I was talking about do not initialize the stage because you'll ruin everything and you'll break my objectives. Uh, this particular one works a little bit differently. With that system, it counted how many rotations of the screws it took to get from point A to point B, and that's how it knew where it was in space. So it had to initialize by going to the four corners. With an optical stage, it basically looks down and says, oh, there I am. 
makes life a lot easier. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, this version of the microscope also uses a newer version of the software. This is the LASX software. Uh, and this one also includes the 3D module. So we'll be working with that. And then just some minor little things like a touch, uh, a touch screen LCD on the front. So we don't go punching him in the nose anymore to turn turn the fluorescence on and off. Um, but overall, as I said, it does look very similar to the last microscope, just a little, uh, little newer. So what we're going to be really doing here is dealing with three-dimensional structures, especially in cancer research, cancer biology. When you're dealing with live cells that are growing in dishes, if you think about it, cells in your body don't grow on a flat surface. So if I take some cells and pop them into a dish and they're growing on a flat dish and they're all spread out, that is not the way they normally interact. And so you're not going to get the same kind of results when you're doing experiments. So instead what we do is we have these little things um, growing in a matrix, usually a collagen matrix. So kind of think of it like a little seed growing in the middle of a bowl of jello and it's growing out in multiple directions. So what you're seeing in the picture here is an esophageal cancer spheroid and those red cells are actually the cancer cells invading out into the uh, uh, matrix gel. Uh, and this is with a 10x objective. So it gives you an idea of much lower magnification. I am going to get out of this and we are going to go to live uh, view. Okay, so you might recognize some of this from last time. I did take the time this afternoon to set everything up because I don't wanna go through everything that we did last time. What we wanna do is build on that. As I said, I will kind of go through these settings, but I'm gonna go through them quickly and just kind of give you an idea of what we're up to at this point. So to begin with, when we turn on these scopes, we're always going to start in the top left corner and we're going to go to configuration, which we did last time. We would go to the laser configuration. We would make sure that our lasers are turned on, which they are, obviously, because I've been working it, with it today. We next go to hardware and make sure that the bit depth or the resolution in this case is what they're calling bit depth is at 12 bits. Uh, just like last time, our detectors are 12 bit detectors. Now, one of the things that uh, Ken uh, did with the recording that we had last time was he had to keep zooming in because these numbers in the top left corner are so tiny that people like me can barely see them. But I have a little treat for you all. This time, I have this little slider up in the top left, and I can make all that a lot bigger. So uh, the downside to making it bigger is I now also have to scroll up and down to get to all the different things that we're going to work with. But I think that's a small price to pay for you to be able to see what I'm doing. So we've turned the laser on. Uh, we've uh, made sure we're at 12 bits. And then we have to come through and start setting up the basics. So we're going to be working a uh, format uh, at 512 by 512. Then we take our images at 1024 by 1024 pixels. Our speed is at 600. Uh, we could set it to other values, but we discussed that last time. We'll leave it right there. We're on bi-directional. Remember that whole typewriter kind of a thing. We want to make sure that we are scanning in both directions. It speeds up the process quite a bit. Um, at the moment, we are actually zoomed in to a zoom of 4x on our 63x objective. So what you're actually seeing on the screen is a little ball of cells. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but it's at relatively high magnification. So uh, unlike that uh, esophageal cancer spheroid that we saw before, this is a, excuse me, a much smaller little uh, thing to look at. Uh, okay, so zooming in, we don't have to worry about, if you remember last time I talked about a magic number being 80 nanometers, um, that was the pixel size, which right here you can see is at 90 nanometers. Um, but uh, we're going to come back and talk about that a little bit later. We're also going to talk about this optical section underneath it. So you see right here, it says optical section. And again, I'm over on the left hand side, and I'm moving my mouse around. So hopefully you can see that. Um, the optical section is at 0.896 microns. And we'll talk about what that means when we get to creating our stack of images. Underneath here, in order to get one good image, so the image that you're seeing on the screen over on the right side of your screen, I took um, essentially the same way that I did last time, the way I talked to you last time about doing this. We wanted to get one good single slice in 2D. And so we made our decisions about quality and how long it took um, and intensity and what was going to quench and all that, we factored all that into our heads and we worked out with some numbers. So 
Some of the numbers that I worked out here uh, included a line accumulation of two so that I could keep the laser settings down a little bit so that we didn't blast them with too much light. Uh, we did a frame average of six for this image over here that reduces the amount of noise and makes it a smoother looking image, which is very useful. Uh, it's rotated a little bit, but that doesn't really matter on there. Uh, coming down, you can see the pinhole is set at one airy unit, and we're just going to keep it there. That's our standard default. Now I'm going to start scrolling down. Now, one of the things that we didn't work with last time was this whole box. We're going to come back to it in a few minutes. Uh, but this is how we set up the range that we're going to be working with when we're going through uh, acquiring a stack um, of images. So we're going to come back to the settings for that in a minute. Underneath that, we have this little box here. This is the box for the AFC, the Adaptive Focus Control. The fact that we have this nice little green light over on the left is a good thing. That tells me it's working. If that was red, uh, I'd have to try to figure out why it's not working. But at the moment, it's basically telling me that it's on, it's active, and it's keeping everything in the same plane. So if we get some air currents in here, which uh, cause a little bit of Z drift, uh, it's going to compensate for that and take care of it. So that's good. All right, so to get the best image uh, out of uh, our our uh, section over here or out of our cells over here. We also wanted to make sure that we didn't have any overlapping signals. In this particular experiment, it's very important that we do not have any overlapping signals. So we made sure to do a sequence this time of three different things. So each of the three colors, the blue, the green, the red that you're seeing was taken individually. They were not taken simultaneously at the same time. And that's to make sure that we get a good separation of signals. So when we have this set up with sequence one, sequence two, sequence three, if I click on sequence one, you're going to see things shift around a little bit. And these are the settings for the DAPI. Sequence two are the settings for the green image that you're seeing up there. And sequence three are the settings for the red. Now, before we actually get started, uh, we also need to understand just a little bit about what it is that we're seeing because you can't just start imaging and say, oh, hey, I'm going to take what looks good. Uh, now, you might want to if you're just looking for a pretty picture, but that doesn't help very much if you're trying to talk about science. So what we're looking at here are, let's see, I, I wrote it out to make sure I got it right. So this is a HT55 can colon cancer cell line. That's what these are. And what you're looking at is a little ball of uh, cell that are together. The staining that you're looking at, the blue is Herxt, which is uh, equivalent to DAPI, but it labels nuclei. So it labels DNA basically in live cells. So we can do this uh, live. These cells are live, by the way. They're sitting up in this little chamber on the uh, stage and they are living happily in 5% CO2 environment. Um, so in addition to the Herxt label, we have the two green labels, the, or the two other labels. The green is what's called Mitre Tracker Green FM. And what Mitre Tracker Green is, is a specific label that's going to image only mitochondria. And not only just mitochondria, but mitochondria that are active. So green is good. It's showing us that here we have some good mitochondria going on. Now the red is also staining mitochondria. Uh, it's a different stain. This is a DMRM stain, which is a, I'll say it's tetramethyl rhodamine methyl ester perchlorate. See, that's why I wrote it down. So what is TMRM staining? I even Googled that. TMRM staining is used to monitor mitochondrial function. When mitochondrial membrane potential collapses in apoptotic or, metabol or metabolically stressed cells, the TMRM reagent is dispersed throughout the cell cytosol and fluorescence levels drop dramatically. Okay, starting with that, let's just kind of bring it down to the basics. What are we looking for? We're basically looking for two different labels with the green and the red. They're both labeling mitochondria, but it's two different conditions of mitochondria. And as the cells progress through their life cycle, the amount of red and green is going to change and alter. So in the experiment that we're actually doing here, we need to do some measurements specifically of the red and the green intensities to figure out how much of each is going on. Uh, if I get a chance later, I will show you how we can do that measuring. But for right now, we're just going to continue. So let's take a look at what we have going on with our 
um, laser line. So to begin with, I'm gonna click over here on the left sequential scan on sequence one. So in sequence one up at the top, these are laser lines that we're choosing. We have three going. We have the 405, which is used for DAPI, Herx, the things like that, which are DNA-based things. So that's the 405 laser. I have it at a very low power right now. It's at 1.5% of its total, which is good. And part of the reason for keeping it low is you have to consider that when you are imaging live cells, there's something called phototoxicity. So basically cells don't like it when you light them up. Uh, they tend to shrivel up and die. And that is going to affect the results of your experiment. So you need to be able to keep the intensities of the light particularly low if possible. So sequence one with our DAPI is set to 1.5%. Uh, now, meanwhile, down here underneath at the bottom, uh, this is very similar to what we were seeing on our other screen last time. It's just kind of laid out a little bit differently. You can see that we're also showing PMT1, which is our first uh, detector, PMT detector. Then we have high D2, PMT3, high D4, and PMT5. So just like with the other confocal, we have five different detectors, and they're laid out in an array. We're using PMT1 for the DAPI and we're setting it up between 410 and 480 nanometers for the emission. When you look at the curve along the top here, this is showing you the emission curve for the Herx. actually. I have it set up for Herx. You can see over on the right that I've selected uh, Herx as, uh, as the curve to display with this. Okay, the gain on this is also at 689, which is pretty good. I like to try to keep it less than 700. If I can, that gives me less noise. So we're going to go with that. And then from there, we should be ready to go. Now I'm going to go to sequence two. So if I click on sequence two at the bottom left, what we're going to see, it's going to shift. And now you'll see that we have the 488 laser going. So the 488 laser is going to excite our a mitotracker tracker green dye. And when it does, it's going to emit along the curve here that's in the, in the green part. So we've got the detector set. Uh, this time, the high D detector is turned on, high D2, and it's set between 495 and 553 nanometers. The reason for this, I want to keep it a little bit away from the laser line to make sure that we are not accidentally looking directly at the laser. Remember, we don't want to do that. And then over to the right side, I've set this so that if you look at the, um, the emission for the red dye, which is this one that's kind of in the grayer area or the red area over to the right. I want to make sure that I'm not detecting any of the light that might be coming from that dye, just in case we get some overlapping signal. So you can see here, the only stuff I'll be getting is the mitotracker green, so that's pretty good. This is set for a gain of 91 at the moment. And if we go back up and take a look at what my laser power is, it's nice and low at point so 0.3%, that's very low. So I'm happy about that, keeping that down. All right, now we're gonna to go to sequence three. And with sequence three, we again are using a 0.3 percentage on the laser. So we're keeping that low for our live cells. And now we're coming down to high D4 uh, and we're turning that detector on down here. Now this one is set from 590 nanometers and then it's going all the way up. Remember every photon is sacred. We wanna make sure to get every single drop. Um, now I do have it kind of cutting in uh, to some of the detection area here because I did want to make sure that if there's any of that green emitting that we're not really picking it up in this uh, channel over here. So that's why I'm not closer. I'm missing some of the, the hump of this emission curve uh, in the middle that you're seeing in that spectrum. Okay, so those are some of our initial setup things. Now, I did take this picture earlier, as you can see here, but another thing about live cells is they change. So uh, I am assuming that those cells are still gonna be in there, but I don't know that for a fact. So I'm just gonna take my settings the way are, they are right now, and I'm gonna come back over to 
my initial acquisition. And we're just going to turn things on and make sure that they're still there and that we can still see something. So to begin with, our format, remember when we're viewing live, we're going at 512 by 512 so that we can speed up the process. So I'm just going to come down to the bottom of the screen right now. I'm going to hit live. And what you're going to see over on the right is going to be replaced by a live view. So here we go. I'm clicking on live right now. And hey, everything still seems to be pretty close to where I had it focused before. So you can thank the, thank the AFC for that. So I am now going to be focusing up and down through that whole volume of the cells. And if you have a hard time seeing what's on the screen here, you're not alone. So one of the things that I like to do when I'm looking at things live on the screen is switching to an over under lookup table. This is going to make it easier for me to see if something's actually there or maybe a little out of focus in the background. But as you can see, perhaps, I am slowly focusing up and down through this thing. And it's taking a while to get through the entire set. So this is our volume that we're going to be working with. OK, so let's get into some additional settings now for how we're going to work with the 3D aspect of what we have going on here. So the image that I took before, as I said, was designed to get a high quality, high resolution, good single image. If it takes a minute to image, I don't care. An image, uh, a minute doesn't take that much time and that's perfectly fine. But things are gonna change when we start getting into taking stacks. And what we're going to realize is that time really becomes of the essence. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna set this up and see how long is this actually going to take if I left all the conditions the same so that I got the absolute best that I could out of it. But before we even get to that, I need to go back to my PowerPoint and talk to you just a little bit about a couple of other settings that we're going to be looking at. Um, before And again, I'm bouncing around a little bit. I know that. So we're going to be dealing next with this whole Z stack thing over here. Now, before I go to PowerPoint, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to uh, 256 by 256 to speed it up even more. And I am going to set my Z stack range. So the first thing you have to do with the Z stack is actually go to the bottom of what you want to take, set that location, then go to the top of what you want to take, set that location, and then figure out how many slices you're going to do. So I'm going to do that first. So I'm going to go live. And I am going to focus down through the entire volume of this ball of cells until I get just past it, which is somewhere around here. I am going to mark that as my begin point. So over in the Z stack box on the right, I set that. Now I'm going to go back up through that entire volume of cells all the way up. We're going to keep going and keep going and keep going till we get all the way through to the other side. And I keep going and I keep going. <laughs> okay, it's up around there. And I'm going to hit end. And I'm going to stop for a second. Now, one thing that you might have noticed as we went through there is things were getting a little dimmer as we went up. And that kind of makes sense. Because if you think about it, when we started, we were very close to the surface of the uh, of the glass. And as we go farther up into the cells, we're actually looking through the rest of that ball of cells. And some of the light that's coming through that ball of cells is getting, getting dispersed. And so it's giving us a weaker signal as we go down through it. So we can correct for that, but I think that's just going to take too much time today. But there is another way that we can go about it. And this is usually what I do. Knowing that while I image, I'm probably going to be bleaching my cells somewhat. What I actually like to do is start at the top. Start at the top, work my way down to the bottom. So instead of starting at the bottom and, and going to the top, I'm going to change my, my Z positions and I'm going to go live again and know that right now I'm up at the top and I'm going to hit begin at the top. And then I'm going to go back down all the way through all that to get back down to the bottom. So this way, it sort of compensates a little bit for this variability that I get as I go through the entire stack. OK, now we're about at the bottom. So I'm going to hit end, and then I'm going to stop that. 
All right, now in this software over on the left, something that took, oh, I don't know, about nine months to figure out because uh, most of these microscope manufacturers don't tell you all the little tricks and tips that you need to know. There's a very important sequence. You have to hit the begin button. Then you have to hit the end button. Then you have to click on the two arrows here and move to center. And then you have to mark that position and set the focus. Then you have to come down to the bottom to the AFC and you have to say, um, set the AFC position. Okay, with all those set, it's now going to give me the correct adjustments. Now, the next thing we have to do is we have to go through some other numbers and figure out how many slices are we gonna take? How thick are those slices going to be? And this is actually where I need to go back to my PowerPoint and do a little bit more explanation. So, so when we're talking about a slice, in our brain, we think we've got this nice thin slice, and that's great. It is a nice thin slice, but you know what? It's not so paper thin that it doesn't have some depth to it. It does have some depth. So you got to remember that there is a certain amount of depth. Now, how, how thick is that? Well, it's going to depend on your pinhole. Now, we talked about that last time. A small pinhole is going to give you a thin slice. So let's just say for numbers to play with here, that thin slice is about 0.75 microns, as we're showing here. Now, if I make a thicker pinhole, if you remember from last time, that gives us more light, but it also reduces our resolution. Maybe we don't want to lose that resolution, but maybe we want the more, more light. So it could be a compromise. But if we go to a thicker slice, we're going to get, a, uh, excuse me, a, um, a bigger pinhole, we're going to get a thicker slice. So let's say a larger pinhole is going to give us uh, 1.25 micron. So you got to keep that in mind when you think about just what kind of resolution you're going to get going through that Z volume. One thing that we often forget as well is that the resolution in Z is never going to be as good as the resolution in X and Y. In X and Y, uh, you're going to get to your theoretical resolution of light, which is about 0 0.2 microns or 200 nanometers. That's there's a, um, uh, a formula by Ernst Abbey from the 1800s that comes up with that number. And I'm not about to go through it all with you, but you'll just have to trust me that that's your basic resolution uh, of, of light without going to super resolution techniques. So um, how do I, I'm trying to figure out how I want to I'm just getting ahead of myself there. So uh, Ernst Dabby tells us about that resolution. Oh, I know what I was talking about. So in X and Y, it's 200 nanometers. But in Z, in Z, you're only going to get about three times that. So instead of 200 nanometers, you're going to get 600 nanometers in Z resolution. So you need to keep that into, uh, take that into consideration when you're figuring out how many slices you want to take. Okay, now when we are figuring out how many slices, we can have a volume. So here we have a little cylinder with a volume through it. We have that slice that's about 0.75 microns. And if we say to ourselves, you know what, if I do uh, X number of slices and they are one micron apart, we're actually gonna run into a problem because one micron is larger than the thickness of that slice. So if I do that, we're gonna wind up with gaps. So we have to look at some numbers before we try to figure out uh, what those steps can be, how far apart those steps can be, because we don't wanna leave any gaps. Ideally, we, what we wanna do is choose a step uh, size that is thinner than the section thickness. So if the section thickness in this case is 0.75 microns, if we went to say 0.5 microns instead, we're going to wind up with overlapping slices. And that's going to make sure that we get all of the information as we go from top to bottom through our uh, sample. Now, when we're doing this, remember we are going through the Z on purpose because we know that there are things throughout our cell at different points. Some things could be directly above the other. Other things are going to be off to the side. When we do collect all of our images, we're going to have to think about how we're going to display these things. One of those ways is maximum projection, where essentially what you're going to do is take all of the slices that you've taken and pancake them together. But that can create some problems. So let me show you. 
if the first slice looks like this, and we have a little red dot right in the middle of it, we looked at, at it from the top, which is the view that you would see looking down through the microscope, you're going to see a circle, you're going to see a little red dot in the middle. Okay, that's great. Now we continue to focus down to the next slice. The next slice is going to be, okay, let's just say there's nothing in it. So we don't see any dots. Okay, fine. Let's go down another slice down. And now we got a green dot in there. Now you and I know, because we're doing the Z thing and we're focusing down through this, that that red dot and that green dot are at different planes. They are not together. Right? They, are, they are separated in Z. Remember that. So let's continue down our next slice. Again, maybe, uh, maybe blank. And our next slice might have a blue dot in it off to the side. Fine. So what happens when we pancake all these together? We get a yellow dot and a blue dot. Wait a minute, where'd yellow come from? We had red and green. Well, yellow is what happens when you overlap a red dot with a green dot with fluorescence. You get what's called co-localization. So from the top, these look like they are 100% co-localized. They're taking up the same space. But we know when we look at this from the Z side, from the side, that they are not. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing stacks. And one of the reasons why maximum projections isn't always the best way to do the analysis. Now, a maximum projection of these spheroids happens to look just fine. These are melanoma spheroids going from very happy, healthy green cells over on to the left to very sickly dead ones over on the right. Anything where you're seeing blue are dead cells, and the ones that are green don't look quite as happy as the ones on the left. They're not nicely spread out. And that's because these particular uh, melanoma cells got treated with a two-drug treatment to try to kill them. Um, more, more story behind that. Now, again, when we're talking about display of things, when we capture these 3D things, this is something else that we can do. We can take them and turn them into a 3D reconstruction. This is an isosurface reconstruction. So you're essentially looking at the surface. And this also has color depth coding to make it look like you can see some depth there. I can show you a picture like this. We can make this today. Um, ultimately, you might make a little movie where you're focusing down through it and again, creating that isosurface and then rotating it and looking at it from different directions. These are all the different kinds of things that we want to do with our movies. Last, we're going to look at this. This is not uh, um, exactly confocal. It's two photon intravital microscopy, but it's very similar to the same thing. Again, we're taking stacks and we're focusing through some brain tissue here where we're looking at the vasculature in green, some metastatic uh, cancer cells in red, and the dura from the brain uh, in blue. All right, so that's the kind of stuff that we're looking for. Now, how do we get there? Now, with all of that thought in mind, let's come back over to here and say, okay, how many slices do we want? Well, we can look at some of this and we can say, what do we have set up? Well, if I'm not quite sure what I want to do, I might come down here and click on something called System Optimized. I'm going to start with that. System Optimized says, OK, I know what objective you're using. I know what wavelengths you're using. I know what your zoom is. I know what your pixel size is. It's going to throw all that into this formula for Nyquist. And it's going to spit out, these are the numbers that you need to use. So if I don't want to think about it and I want to go with auto, this is what it's going to tell me to do. It's going to say your Z, Z, step, Z step size should be 0.3 microns. Um, and the number of steps should be 108. So 108 slices to get through this entire volume. And they'll be 0.3 microns apart. Now, how does that match up with other numbers up at the top? If we come up to the top, let's take a look at our optical section here. The optical section says 0.896 microns. So if we are at 0.3 microns down here with the step size, we're good. Right, The thickness of our slice is 0.896 microns, and we are setting it up for a 0.3 micron um, step size. So we're going to get a lot of overlap. Nyquist calculations, which it uses for this optimized settings, actually tells us that we want to make sure that we're getting two and a half times oversampling. So it's actually going to oversample everything. 
and that's fine. Okay, so if we just start with that, I'm going to show you why going with the auto settings can be a problem. So we have 108, we have 0.3, we're ready to go, we have everything set up. What am I forgetting? I have to go up to my 1024 by 1024, right? Because we scan at 512 and we take our pictures at 1024, right? That's what we do for a good image. So I've set those up. I'm going to come over to the start button in the middle. I'm going to hit start. And what it's going to go do is it's going to go to the first slice and it's going to start doing my image. Now, what do I have set up over on my left? On my left, we have this set up for a frame average of six and a line accumulation of two. So it's taken a while. It's on slice number one right now, and it's doing it six times to get that nice averaging that we get. Now, if you look at the bottom of the screen in a second, this is gonna come up with how much more time we're gonna have to wait to go through this entire volume with these settings. And what we're gonna run into is, oh, it's only gonna take 55 more minutes. Okay, I don't know about you, but I don't want to sit here for 55 minutes to go through this entire volume. So for round numbers, that's an hour, an hour to do this whole thing. So we have to start thinking, where can I make some changes? What can I do? So there's some things right off the bat that we can do. We can go up to the top and we can say, okay, 1024 by 1024, do we really need that level of resolution? Well, we talked about this last time. I told you there was that magic number with the pixels size. And although this isn't exactly precise, it's a good rule of thumb for what we're doing today. And that magic number was 80 nanometers. So if I come down here over on the left and I see my pixel size and I see what size it is, it says it's 45 nanometers. 45 nanometers is about half roughly of 80 nanometers. So that means I'm shooting this at twice the resolution I really need to do. So you know what? I'm going to change 1024 to 512. So I just cut my size in half, which means I just cut the scanning time in half. So now instead of an hour to scan this entire thing, it's only going to take a half an hour. OK, great. Only a half an hour. All right. What else can I do? Well, how about that frame average of six? Do we really need to do it six times? Well, if you remember last time when I was going through this thing, we were showing you that there really wasn't much of a difference once you got above four scans. So the short answer is no, we do not need six scans. I could in fact cut this back to three. And if I cut it back to three, that's gonna cut it in half again, isn't it? So now instead of, a half an hour, it's going to be about 15 minutes to scan through this entire thing. Getting closer, getting closer. But you know what? I could do even less than that. The reality is that noise reduction is taken care of in multiple ways. And it's not just how many times you scan a single slice. But if you have overlapping slices, those overlapping slices are going to help cancel out the noise in each other overlapping slice. So the reality is that I can actually cut my frame av averaging back to two. So instead of 15 minutes, I'm now down to about 10. And if I was really following Nyquist's uh, formula, they actually tell you no averaging whatsoever. So I could go down to one, but for me, I'm gonna leave it at two. I made that decision. That's a conscious decision to keep the quality level today good enough so that you can see it. Because if I follow Nyquist and I go to no um, uh, averaging whatsoever, then I have to do post-production with deconvolution. And that takes more time in something I can't show you today because that's on another computer, another workstation. OK, so what else can we do? All right, so let's see. Let's think about what else I have going on. We're down to about 10 minutes, right? But I still would like to get it a little bit faster than that. So how can I do that? Hmm, I'm looking at this line accumulation here and I'm saying line accumulation of two. If I could get rid of that line accumulation, go down to no accumulation, or in other words, change it to one, all right? I just cut it in half again. So we're now down to about five minutes. Um, and this I could deal with. Five minutes is actually something that I could potentially deal with. 
I think I can get it even lower than that though. Now, however, if I'm going down to here, I did lose some light. Remember we did accumulation so that we could increase the amount of light as we we're going through the process. And by cutting it from two to one, I just really pretty much cut the intensity of my signal in half. So if I go back to live mode right now and take a look at what I'm seeing, you're gonna see things are a bit dimmer than they were before. So I'm gonna have to somehow figure out how to make all that a little bit brighter now. All right, now, how can I make it brighter? I could turn up the gain. I could turn up the laser light. Now, luckily for us, I started with very, very low laser levels. So I feel actually very comfortable by going to over on the left side, I'm going to go to sequence one. Remember, sequence one was our DAPI image. Over on the right side where you see the images, it's the one in the top left. Now, this is at 1.5%. I'm going to change that to three. So I doubled that, so I should get my light back. If I go to sequence two, sequence two, I had it 0.3, so I'm going to increase that one to 0.6. And sequence three, I have my red one, and I'm going to increase that one also to 0.6. All right, so these are still relatively low. Uh, the red and the green are both below 1%, which is great. Um, so we're not going to get too much phototoxicity or bleaching from that. So I'm going to go live now and see how much brighter that made things. Not bad. I think I can deal with that. Now, remember, one of the things that we want to keep in mind when you're looking at the over under lookup table, so that's this green background that you're seeing with the scan with the sort of flame colored orangey things. If we see any blue pixel showing up, those are pixels that are oversaturated. That would mean that I've made things too bright. Well, they're not too bright. I don't see any. If I go live again, and let's say I go up to the DAPI image, and I increase the gain a bit, you're going to see, oh, there's some blue pixels. So that's way too much. So again, I'm going to bring the gain back down to where I was. That's pretty good. Now I'm also going to click on my green one. We're at 91 gain with the high D. Remember, I don't want to go above 100, so that's okay. I'm going to click on the red one down here. We're at a gain of 71. I can go up to 100. I'm going to turn it up just a touch. That's not too bad. It's around 91 again. And I'm going to hit stop for just a second while I explain the next thing. When you are doing a stack, it's very important that you consider how bright every pixel is in that stack. So everything that I just did applied only to this one slice. So when I adjusted the brightness, I'm adjusting it for this slice, which happens to be right smack in the middle of the stack. So what I need to do really right now is go live again and go through the stack and make sure that I don't have any saturated pixels anywhere in the stack. I can see some coming up in the DAPI. So I'll click up there, turn that down on the gain a little bit to get rid of those. But we look pretty good with the green and the red. So I think we're going to be fine working with these numbers. And you see what I'm happy about in the lower right hand corner of the images is I am seeing some differentiation in red and green, which is what we're trying to do with this assay with the mitochondrial differentiation. Basically, we're looking at polarization uh, of the membrane potentials. Okay, I think we are almost ready to go, except I forgot it. There's one other thing I was going to do. Something else that slows us down is these sequences. We're doing a sequence one, two, three. It takes time to go to each one of those. I can speed things up if I can combine some of these. Now, if you remember from our discussion last time, I can never combine DAPI or in this case, Herxt with anything else because if we look on sequence one and we go and we look at the curve for that, the emission curve in the middle here in the spectrum, you can see that it goes way up into the 600, 650 range. So in other words, if DAPI is on and exciting, it's going to emit 
all the way through everything that I'm looking at. That's no good. So we have to do the, the Herxt or the DAPI by itself. But the sequence two and three, I think if I look at those two, you can see that those two peaks are pretty well separated. And I have the detectors pretty well separated as well. I'm actually fairly confident that we can combine these two things. So what I'm going to do is in sequence two right now, I'm actually going to come up and I'm going to turn on the white light laser to the same setting, which was 0.6. So it's on down here. And then I'm also going to turn on the detector for that. I got to slide down here. We want the high D4 detector on. All right, here it is. So it's in the same position that it was in the other one. Now, right now over on the left, you can see I've got a magenta color set for high D4 here. So I got to change that to red. Okay, cool. All right, now what I can now do is turn on sequence three and get rid of it. Because instead of doing sequence one, two, and three, I'm gonna do sequence one. And sequence two is now going to be the red and the green simultaneously. So it'll do the Herxt and then the red green, then the Herxt, then the red green. It'll go a little bit faster that way. So if we were down at around five minutes before, I'm guessing in round numbers, we're going to be around four minutes when we do this. So I think we're at the moment of truth. So I am now going to hit the start button down here. Remember, we're going to keep this at 512 up top. We're still sticking with a speed of 600 hertz, uh, although I could even speed that up a little more. But for right now, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, and we are ready to go. So are we ready? One, two, three, hitting the start button at the bottom now. And here we go, it goes up to the top and it's gonna go first slice twice, second slice twice, and look at that. We're down to three minutes left. If you look down in the middle over here, the middle of, this, of the left side of the screen, it's telling us how much time we've got left to, to go through this whole thing. So this is now gonna go through the entire stat. It's starting deep into the ball, so that's why everything is a little bit weak right now. We're starting at the top, and it's working our way down. It doesn't look like it's actually focusing through much, because remember, that slice is overlapping a lot. Every image should have, every slice should have some of the previous slice in it as well in order to get all the detail out. So as it's continuing and continuing and continuing, oh, I just realized something else. As I'm going through all these things, there was something else that we could have changed. So I'm going to keep it going because four minutes actually isn't all that bad. And it gives me something to talk about while we're waiting for this to happen. Um, the other thing that we could have changed was the number of steps. So the number of steps was at 108. And 108 as, a, as I mentioned before, is part of what that Nyquist setting is with two and a half times over sampling. So again, we don't really need 108. We could have actually cut that in half. So if we'd gone down to like 54, which was half of that, this would have taken instead of, uh, instead of four minutes, no, we were at three minutes. It would have taken a minute and a half to do the entire thing. Amazing, actually, if you think about it. Um, but here we go, here we go. We're down to one and a half minutes left. If I've got a bunch of these to image, I can deal with a minute and a half. I cannot deal with taking an hour to image each one. If you think back to that image that I showed you in my PowerPoint where I had the three green melanoma spheroids, those were some images that were taken on two versions of the confocal before this. When I first came here to Wistar, uh, I started with the Leica SP2 confocal, and then we got the SP5 confocal, and now we have the SP8. On the SP2, I had some major limitations to it, including things like I couldn't do the, the back and forth scanning, the bi-directional. I could only go in one direction. I didn't have a DAPI laser, so that 405 laser wasn't going to work, and other things like that. Bottom line was each one of those spheroids took about 25 minutes to scan. I could get eight done in one day. That's it. Total, eight total things. So if this takes me four minutes to do one uh, for the scanning, and it took me maybe 10 minutes total to set it up and process it, I can get eight done in about an hour and a half. So you can see you can be a lot more efficient 
uh, once you have higher quality instrumentation with higher resolution and more options to be able to work with. So we are now just about down to the end. Our stack is now complete. Pretty cool. So if I come over to the open projects on the left, the first thing that I want to do is come down here to where it says series 04. Now I've been taking some images today, so that's why there's some stuff that's already up here. And what I'm looking at is series 04 tells me that that stack of images that we just took isn't all that big. It's only about 181.9 megabytes. So relatively small for some of these things. I am going to right click and give it a new name. This is going to be O2 because it's our uh, second image here. And it's going to be 63x4x, which is the magnification that I just used. And that's really, oh, and then I'm going to put stack in here as well. And I'm going to put 512 just for our reference so that I know what I did. Uh, and then I am going to just save that there. Now I'm going to update. I'm going to save this file right now, save this project. And the reason I'm doing all this is because if you've just spent a bunch of time taking a bunch of images, you don't want Microsoft coming in and deciding now is a good time for an update and then crashing everything on you. That's happened to me before. So you want to make sure that once you have acquired something that you save it immediately before you do anything else. So if we come down here and we look at our stack, this is our stack. Oh, why am I looking at something there? Well, let's look over to the right and you'll notice that I now have this slider where I can go up and down through everything. Oh, very nice. Everything seems a little on the dim side, doesn't it? Well, let's come back up to where my over under lookup table was here, turn that off and take a look at grayscale. And you'll notice in the grayscale, you're probably gonna be able to see it a little bit better. Notice in the bottom left, this is the mitochondria with the red. And you notice that we're having some less distinct mitochondria. It's kind of blurring out in the middle here a little bit. This is because these mitochondria are being affected by the dye since I took that first one. And so they're changing. The red is getting less. There's a little green coming and a little bit of combination going on. This is the stuff that we actually want to measure. All right, now I'm going to change to color again. And again, I'm looking here, I can barely see it, but I can make these colors pop a little bit more just so that it makes life a little bit easier for us to see what we're doing. And that looks pretty good. Okay, so now if I take my slider over on the left and I go up and down through it, you can see that I can go to any of the slices in that entire stack. All right, now here we run into the fun situation of we have now captured a three-dimensional stack of images on a two-dimensional computer screen, and we want to display this for people so that they can see it. Now, how do we do that? Hmm, that's a good question. And there's a lot of different answers to it. So it kind of depends on your audience. It kind of depends on what you want to show. Uh, and it kind of depends on uh, you know, how much time you have to work with this. So to begin with, let's think of a scientific audience. A scientific audience is going to get the idea of I've got a ball of cells and I'm focusing top to bottom. And as I focus through, I see some stuff here. I see some stuff there going back and forth. So if I want to take a little movie of this and just play through the stack, I can do that. So if I come up here to the right, just to show you what that looks like on the screen, Screen. First, I'm going to double click on my image so you can see the whole thing. And then I'm going to click on the little play button over on the right hand side here. And I'm just going to play through that. And you can see this is playing through the whole stack. Scientific audience is going to get this. They'll understand what that means. So why don't I just make a little movie, a little AVI movie out of this thing? Okay. So to do that, this is the first way of showing my three dimensional information. Now, before I even get there, you might notice if you look closely on your screen that this looks a little noisy, a little grainy. One of the things that you're actually going to find out at the highest magnifications is it's actually fairly helpful to give it a little bit of a blur. So I'm going to come over here to our stack of images on the left, all the way to the left. 
uh, where I have my raw data. And then I'm going to come up to the top uh, ooh, uh, where it says process. And I'm going to have some options over on the left hand side here where I can adjust some noise reduction and go to blur. Under the blur, I can give it a kernel size of three or five or seven, basically odd numbers. If I stick with the five and I kind of go into the middle, you'll see on the left side and the right side, the difference between the two. If I do a preview with a kernel of five, it's gonna look like that. You can see the difference if I go back and forth. This is with the blurring, this is without the blurring. You can see a significant difference in the amount of noise and pixel um, artifacts that's showing up. If I go to three and preview that, is that any better or is that worse? Hmm, actually, I think, I think I like three better. I'm gonna go with three. So I've picked a kernel size of three. I'm gonna apply those. And one of the things that you need to understand in all of photography is that if you change your original, you wanna immediately save a new version of that, right? Well, like a beat us to the punch, instead of overwriting that original by doing that blur, it made a new stack with the blurred set. And so down here at the bottom now in red where it's selected is that entire stack only blurred. And it gave it a little name after it that said blur. So it's the same preview or prefix, but now it says blur at the end. And this is the one I'm gonna work with. My raw data is still back here in the earlier version. Okay, now if I wanna make a movie of this, uh, again, I'm going to adjust my colors a little bit so that they look a little bit brighter and easier to see. To make a movie of this, I'm gonna come over to the right-hand side and I'm gonna right click where that blur in red is. And I'm gonna come up to export and I'm gonna export an AVI file. I am going to browse to today's folder. So today's folder is in the data drive D. I got a lot of uh, folders that I have to go through. Images, we're in the Jamie folder. We're in the BCA workshop folder for today. And here we go. Uh, I am going to give it a name, which has got to be the same thing that I got over there. Colon cancer uh, oligo. Oh, there you go. Okay, now I'm going to save this as an AVI file, but right now all I'm doing is picking the folder to put it in. So I'm going to hit save. And then I have a choice of how fast to make this movie go. Um, I usually go with seven frames per second, but we did kind of a lot of slices here. So I'm going to bump that up to 12 frames per second. I want to overlay my channels so that I make sure that I see a red and green and blue overlay when I make my movie. Um, and then there's some timestamps that I could do at the bottom, but hey, this is only a single timestamp, so I don't need that. But how about a micron scale? Would we like one of those? Sure, why not? Let's go and select micron scale here. And with the mic, I don't know why it just changed up there. I don't really like that, but um, I'm going to put it at the bottom right. I'm going to do a transparent background. I'm going to go with a font size of 12 and hit OK. And that should place a micron scale in my movie. All right. With all that done, I hit save. And ta-da. Now I'm going to go back to my folder for today. And where am I? Data drive. There we go. Images, Jamie, BCA. Oh, look, there's an AVI file in here. Just going to double click on that. And here we go. We now have a nice little movie that you can pop into your PowerPoint. I'll make it a little bit bigger so you can see. I don't know if Zoom is showing this you know, in smoothly or not, it's, it might be breaking up a little bit because just because of the uh, bandwidth. But trust me, when I'm looking at it here, it's a nice smooth uh, playing through the entire movie. And for many of our uh, researchers, this is enough. This shows that three dimensional information.
okay, well, maybe that's not good enough for you. And you were thinking of those really cool 3D reconstructions and that's what you had in mind. What else can we do? Well, let's come back to our original image. And I wanna show you something else that we can also do before we get to that 3D bit. Let's go back to the uh, overlay. Oh, one of the things, remember that maximum projection that we were talking about? Over on the right-hand side, all the way over to the right here, there's a little button that says max. Let's see what maximum projection looks like. And maximum projection is going to give us all 108 slices pancake down into one image. And if we looked at that as an overlay, it looks like that. Maybe that's all you need. But you know what? That doesn't look all that cool to me. I don't really like it all that much. The blue is too bright. Let me knock that back a little bit. Um, the red is also too bright. Knock that back a little bit. Um, and sure, it shows me that I got red, I got green all within this one ball, but it doesn't really show me the Z information. I really want to see the Z stuff. So why don't I get to the Z stuff, Jamie? So I will do that. Uh, first, I have to undo the max projection. Here's the fun stuff. So we have this cool little button over on the right-hand side uh, and it says 3D. So I'm gonna click on that. Ooh, right off the bat, look what comes up. So over on the left, I'm afraid these numbers, I can't make them any bigger, shoot. So they're gonna look tiny on the screen, I'm trying to move the slider in the top left and I can't do it. Um, so, Either way, some of my options here, I'm gonna go back to my home view. So I got my home view. This is the view as if I was looking straight down through this whole thing. Uh, and if I wanna put it on shaded, I wanna make it a little bit brighter. I'm saying, okay, this is pretty cool. I got some green stuff. I got some red stuff. I got some blue stuff, but this looks a lot like that maximum projection, doesn't it? Ah, yes. But how about if you just grab the edge of it and you start moving it around and you look at it from the side and you say, oh, that's cool. There's, a, there's that cell over there to the left. There's another cell over to the right. Remember I told you that the Z resolution isn't as good as it is um, in X and Y. So one of the things I also have to do to make this look a little, little more realistic is change my Z scaling from one to 0 0.7. That's just going to make it look a little bit more like it actually would look. So, okay, cool. This looks pretty good. Now, let's see. I've got three channels on the top left up here. So if I click on the blue one, that's my DAPI. Um, I'm going to turn this over so I can look at it from this side. Instead, I like this side better. Um, I could turn off the DAPI altogether. And so we're just looking at the red and the green. I could turn off the green if you'd like to turn that off. I could turn off the red if you'd like to turn that off. If I could turn off the red and the green, we just get the DAPI. And hey, this looks a lot like that, um, that ovarian cyst that I was showing you back in the beginning, except they're all blue. So I could come up the top left and I could click on depth coding. And depth coding shows me that as I go deeper through the section, uh, the stuff towards one end of it is red, towards the other end is blue. If I wanna reverse the direction, Right now it's showing me a scale direction of Z minus. I could change that to Z plus and just change the uh, which color comes up on top. But this will give me an idea of what I'm seeing there. I can zoom in by the way, I can kind of go through all this, which is really kind of cool, but it would look a lot better if I was doing this with some additional information in there and no depth coding. So here, let's kind of go in and see where are we in here? Oh my gosh, I'm in a sea of mitochondria. Now, anything that you see me doing on the screen can also be recorded as a video file. I, we're not gonna have time to go through that today, um, but down at the bottom here on the left, there is a movie editor and I can go through, I can save a snapshot of anything you see on the screen. So right now I could do a snapshot of what you see right here, or I could move it like this and take a image of that. I could turn my green back on because I forgot that and put that on there, do a snapshot of that. If I wanted to show axis scaling, I could select that and put it in. And if I wanted to make those numbers so that those of you online can actually read those things, I can come down here and I can change that somewhere. Font, here we go. Font, we want to boost that up to, oh, let's try 28. 
That's a little better. So now we can see those things a little bit more. I can move that around a little bit, move that down. Now, what about you want to see what's in the middle of all of this? Well, let's turn off that frame for just a second and come over to this cool thing that says clipping over on the left. Oh, I'm going to turn off the scaling too. So here I have my whole big circle, right? Well, I can clip on click, click on clipping here. I actually have to move this around a little. Oops, hold on. There we go. This is what I'm trying to get to. And I need to see the frame here. Show it in relation to that. Ah, this is what I'm after. Okay, what exactly am I after? Well, we're going to do some clipping. How can I do that? I can take this middle thing that I just pulled up and I can go, oh, let's see what's in the middle of all this. So if I had a hollow sphere, I would basically be seeing blank in the middle, wouldn't I? But as you can see, I don't have a hollow sphere. So those are some different things that we can do. Okay, let's see. If I turn off the clipping, we don't want to show the clipping. And, oh, maybe you don't want a black background. You want a gray background. I can do that too. Um, oh, surface. So if we look at the surface rendering, surface rendering, this is a little tricky. I'm going to first turn off the red and the green ones for a second because surface rendering usually looks pretty good with DAPI and it's going to be a bit harder with some of the other ones. So over on the left, we've been looking at a blended rendering. And if I switch to surface rendering, what it does is essentially puts a skin along the outside surface of the um, of my cells or whatever my, my specimen is. So in this case, it's the nuclei. But you can see I got holes, nice Swiss cheese. Well, if I change the threshold values, I can kind of fill those in a little bit. And now I can get a little bit more information, but now things are starting to blend together. And so here's where it's very important to get good separation of your signal. And when you're just initially acquiring like we did today and not doing any post processing, you are going to be a little bit limited with what you can do with some of these threshold values. I go back to that depth coding, you can see what it does. Anyway, that doesn't look too bad if I'm trying to show here's a bunch of overlapping nuclei. Uh, I can see those in three dimensions, that works. But what about those mitochondria? Let's just look at the red channel for a second, just the red. This is just the red. I'm going to turn off the depth coding again. So we're just looking at the red. The problem here is if I reduce the threshold or if I increase the thresholding, oh, I'm adjusting it on the blue. Let's change the, go to the, oh, let's go to the surface view. This is what happens with the surface view. I've got to adjust that threshold so that I can see more out. But look what happens. It really starts to blend a lot together. And my God, look at all that messy, noisy stuff. So that messy, noisy stuff is because of noise. If you think about it, in our single images, Noise looked like old fashioned grain. It looked like a, you know, a little grainy spot. And if you're trying to make a surface go along and it's following all those grains, it's going up and down and up and down and up and down over every single grain. And that's when you wind up with noise looking this horrible. So you have to do some processing like uh, the deconvolution or even more of that uh, blurring that we did before helps smooth that all out so you can get a better rendition here. I'm not going to go through all the time to do that right now. It takes a while. Um, so I'm just for the moment going to leave that one on the blended view instead. So from a scientific point of view, what I notice here versus the images that I did earlier is this red is not as specific to just the mitochondria anymore. It is starting to spread out or uh, spread out a bit, right? Kind of spread out. And the green, if I show that, there's where the green is. That is just still kind of over in that one cell. If I was to compare this, to an image of the exact same blob of cells that I took earlier.
you'll notice that things are a little bit different. Now, why is that looking like that? I think I know why. I think it's because it's a maximum projection. I have to go back to the original stack or it's not going to work. Here's the original stack. No, that again is a slice. Ah, uh, silly me. Okay, I guess I did not capture that stack earlier. I thought I did. Guess I didn't. Okay, so um, I think that we go back to the 3D. We go back to what we were showing before with the blur. And we're back to where we were before. Okay, so this again, as I said, this is how we're going to be showing some of this. We can create snapshots of this that we can use. We can create a movie of this that rotates around in space. Um, so again, if I go back to just my home view, for instance, and I go back to here and I adjust my thresholds and I say, okay, this is what I want to work with. Um, I can also make some of these things a little bit more transparent so we can see through them a little bit more. I can come down to my movie editor over on the left-hand side and say at the bottom, this is gonna be very hard for you guys to read, but I'm gonna do a rotate and I am going to make it, not do a yo-yo, oh, rotate, I wanna do a 360 degrees um, just in the plus direction. I'm gonna, in the horizontal, I'm gonna hit okay. And if I just do a preview of this, you can see that's what, if I was now to, to save a video file, it would render what you're seeing happening right now. That might be too fast. We can slow that down and make it 200 frames instead. That would slow it down a little bit. Anyway, these are some of the things that we have to take into consideration when we're trying to decide what we're going to do with the images afterwards. Now, one other fun thing I'm going to show you that's an advanced thing is to go back and talk about some of the analysis. And I'm gonna use this image to begin with. So this is one of the single slices that we're through here. And remember I was talking about how we're interested in how intense the light is in the green channel and compare that to the red channel. And so how can we do that? So I just wanna show you up in the top left, I'm gonna to go to the acquire menu again. Um, we wanna go back to our slice here. And I want to go to hmm, where is it? I think what's ah, there it is. <laughs> Sorry, at the top of my screen, I have the zoom box, and it was hiding my analysis uh, or my quantify buttons. So I'm going to go to quantify. So under quantify, what I'm able to do. Okay, come on, select all. Uh, what I'm able to do is say, okay, here is my slice. This is a single slice. I'm going to take over on the left, a line profile. This is what I wanna do, a line profile. And so back over on the right, I'm gonna take a line, draw a line between some different features. So I'm gonna go over in my image, I'm gonna draw a line over some red mitochondria and into some green ones, and then also into some blue ones. So you can see over on the right-hand side here, starting over up at the top left, uh, I started into some black space, and then I came into some red mitochondria, then some more red mitochondria, then some green, then some blue. And all of that is now graphed very nicely for you over on the left in the different channels. The top channel is channel one. This is our DAPI. Honestly, we don't care about DAPI because we're not measuring that. So I can turn off channel one over on the left and just look at the red and the green. So 
the green channel is channel two and the red channel is channel three. So as we come over from the beginning point over on the left, where we're in the black, you can see we're down almost very close to a level of zero uh, for the intensity values in both our red and our green channels. But as I come over to say here, right in the middle where that nice tall vertical line is, you'll notice that I've got a nice big red intensity showing up and it's somewhere around a value of about 1400. But the green is barely above background. It's maybe at 200. So there really isn't anything there. Now, if I continue over to here, I'm gonna move that over to there as well. You're gonna say, oh, look at that. I have nothing in the green, I have a bunch in the red. But if I come all the way over to here to this other one, here I've got mostly, whoops, mostly green in the one over to the far right, right? And that one's pretty high, that's around 2000, whereas my red is down around 800. Now remember in an eight or in an eight bit image, we only have 256 levels of gray. And if that was the way I captured this, these numbers would be something more like, oh, 10 <laughs> for the bottom one and maybe 100 for the top one. It's not a lot of difference. Because we shot this at 12 bits, we've got 4,096 levels of gray to work with. So the 2,000 level up here is what we're talking about. It's, it's right in the middle of that gray scale. And over on the right, 800 on that red one, statistically, perfectly good numbers to work with to come up with uh, um, the statistics that we need to figure out how intense one color is versus another. So without going even any further, we could take this and apply it to 3D data sets where we can create the 3D reconstruction, create 3D region of interests, create a volume that we measure the average intensity within the volume, and then compare the red channel and the green channel. And all of that takes an awful lot more analysis time, but you have to start with a good confocal image like we have here. Uh, I was aiming for an hour and a half to get through to this point. So I actually worked out just a little bit faster and I am going to stop sharing. Okay. Come back and say, hi, I see all your smiling faces now. Great. We're all back. So, so you're, you're all back. So any questions from anybody out in the peanut gallery? Okay. So uh, Jim's got a question. Uh, hi, Jamie. Thank you. As a usual, great presentation. Um, you, you lost me on the depth coding. So okay. uh, it, was, uh, it seemed like it would go from like blue to gold or some sort of a U rather than intensities of blue. So what depth coding does is it basically says, here's the top of my volume, here's the bottom of my volume, and it creates a spectrum that starts at red and, and goes oh. uh, to blue, or starts at blue and it goes to red. It just depends on which direction you want it to go. Um, so greens and yellows are going to be somewhere in the middle. And all you're doing is the software is applying that to every slice as it goes through. So it's a, a gradual transition from the blue through the, the through the green, through the yellow to the red, or from the red through the yellow to the green to the blue. And, um, and that's what gives you that, uh, um, that projection. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the, the color is just for spatial orientation. It's not it is, yeah. It, it's helpful for some things to see that. Um, if there's so much going on, I have some other images that I've used before. Um, there's an image that I have in Images from Science, uh, the last one that is uh, a depth coded image going through a 300 micron block of collagen. Mm. And if everything was in one single color, it just looks like a mess. But because you have that depth coding, you see that fibers that are red are closer to the top, fibers that are blue are all the way at the bottom, and the other ones are somewhere in between. And it just gives you sort of a visual depth cue when you're looking at a two-dimensional image. All right, thank you. That's good. Sure. Great. Uh, Howard? Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Jamie. Um, a couple of questions, uh, Jamie. Uh, when you did the anal you did some analysis at the end of things, but of course, in the course of this, you did a lot of hist essentially histogram adjustment. 
Correct. Uh, to Brighton, et cetera. Correct. So, uh, you know, day to day for for real purposes, at what point does analysis have to be done versus creating uh, in, creating images? So analysis can only be done on the raw files. So when I was showing that analysis, even on ones where I had adjusted the histogram grayscales just to make them look brighter and everything, the, the color adjustments that I was doing was uh, strictly superficial. It was an overlay on top of the original raw data. The raw data was not changed. And in the software, when it comes up with these numbers, that's what it's measuring the raw data, not the uh, adjusted files. Now, if you're trying to come up with some images that you want for a paper and you want to put them side by side, that's where in this case, it's going to get a little trickier because if you adjust one, one level and another one, another level, somebody might say those aren't comparable. So, to be precise about that, uh, you can actually adjust each level exactly the same. So you're making the same adjustments to each. It's not strictly perfectly good either because the uh, adjustments aren't necessarily linear uh, and that can create some issues as well, but it's a good kind of way of getting some uh, visual images that work well in a paper. And in the end, you're really going to be falling back more on the numerical data, which is going to be shown in a graph form anyway. Uh, thanks, Jamie. And another, another question. You're using individual excitation lasers uh, for the individual dyes. Mm -hmm. and, but you are narrowing the acceptance spectrum of the detectors considerably, and you're excluding, uh, in some cases, a lot of the fluorescence from the dyes. Correct. So how much of that can you, can, but you're still recording different channels. Correct. How much of that can you do before you're really obliterating uh, fluorescence information that is there? Uh, where you know the the topography might be very different because there is fluorescence elsewhere, but you're cutting away so much of it, and right. and how much of that is necessary? Yeah, it really boils down to you know, eh, well, it's good today. <laughs> Um, not really, but actually in some respects, that is the case. When a fluorophore emits, it emits along that spectrum. So when you looked at the curves in the, in the spectrum that I showed you, where I showed you the curve for each of the dyes, um, that's showing you that dye. So it's, it's the emission from that dye. So uh, if I'm getting light at the far end of that curve or the close end of that curve, it's all the same dye. It's not showing me different things. So if I adjust the uh, detector to only look at this part or that part, it's all the same information. Uh, it's just how much of it am I getting? So to your point, if I cut that down narrower and narrower, yes, I'm cutting out a lot of my signal. And as I uh, so cutely said earlier, every photon is sacred. Why would I be throwing out some of those photons? Well, it has to do with other issues of overlapping signals. So um, I uh, pointed that out earlier, I wanted to make sure that uh, because I was doing both of the red and the green there together simultaneously, I had both laser lines going at the same time. So that meant that if the green, uh, the 488 laser, which would normally just excite the, the 488 die, if the 488 is emitting and my detector that I've got set up for my red one is underneath any of that curve, it's going to be picking up some of that signal. And so what I did was I separated them enough to make sure that I wasn't getting any of that overlap. Now, I didn't have time today to show you the, the precise way I do it. It was a little more, you know, kind of rule of thumb today, but that's essentially what we're doing. Now, if, if, if I have enough light, if my intensity is high enough and I'm not killing anything, I'm not bleaching anything and the settings that I'm working with today allow me to do that, I've got enough to work with, great, fine. But sometimes you're right, that's not the case. One of those signals might be so incredibly weak that I can't afford to cut any of it out. And if that's the case, then I would have to go back to doing that sequence where I was doing each one individually and making sure that I wasn't getting any overlapping signal 
because I didn't have the over the other dye emitting at the same time. So it is a little wishy-washy. It depends. It's a horrible answer, but that's it. It depends. And this is a lot of what we were really talking about in the uh, in the first session, how to get a good 2D image last month. So does that all make sense? Uh, it makes sense. It, it, maybe my question wasn't phrased right, but we'll save oh. it for another time. No, try again. Um, I, I, I'm concerned that you're that when you are narrowing the bandwidth on the detector mm -hmm. so much yeah. that you are not just you are cleaning the you are cleaning sig weak signal away from many places mm -hmm. uh, and that changes the data and the overlap no. and yes indeed and and it and it is not showing what natural overlap there might be in the different fluorophores spatially so there's always going to be some kinds of different types of overlap for instance you know with some uh, uh autofluorescence thrown in there as well and so if you can cut that out that would be great but you know what you can't because it emits across that entire spectrum as well what i was trying to say at the beginning of my long-winded explanation was that curve is showing you essentially the same thing everywhere along the curve if we're cutting off a little bit at the end or the little bit at this uh, uh, at either end we're reducing the overall intensity, but we're not cutting out, uh, say, a, pro a, a protein that's labeled. We're just not getting um, the wavelength that is being um, created at that point. We're getting the signal at a different part of the wave. It's the same signal, just at different wavelengths. It's showing up across the entire spectrum. I'm just not looking at it where it is out at 600. I'm only looking at it around 590 or something like that, uh, or 580. Um, I think, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand your concern, but uh, I think, yeah, maybe this is something um, that uh, has to be a little earlier in the day with more brain cells firing. But uh, to me, it makes sense anyway, that I'm not, I'm not cutting out um, any signal that isn't already there, that we're just picking up in other wavelengths. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, thanks. How do you collaborate with the scientists? Do they come to you or they, they just tell you what they want? What's the process for the collaboration? And do they, you know, what's their request when they come to you? It runs the gamut. So everybody who wants to use the confocal has to be trained, whether they think they've been trained already somewhere else, uh, or whether they're a newbie graduate student who's never touched a microscope before. So during that training process, uh, I get a feel for what their level of knowledge and expertise is. Uh, and while we're going through the training, part of the, that process is to um, take some of their samples and work with them. So my normal training process now is two days where we use some of these videos. And on day one, uh, we do what we did last month. And on day two, we do what we did today. It's a little bit longer than both of these because it's usually it's a three hour session each time. Right. Uh, but in the second session, uh, we go through the 3D stuff like we just did. And then I take or we take their actual samples, what they're working on. And I help them set everything up so that they can figure out what the optimal settings are. Now, throughout this process, there's a continual back and forth about what it is, how they're labeled, what dyes did they use, what do they expect to see, are they live, are they dead, how are we affecting them, you know, something as simple as bleaching uh, can mess them up, something as simple as phototoxicity can kill the cells and change the results, you know, all these different things, and generally I find that even the people that have who think they've been trained before, I have at least a few little nuggets that they weren't aware of. And so it helps. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it is the optimization does really take into account 
pretty much everything that I've talked about and more. You have to think not only about all these little details about acquisition, but you also have to have an idea of what you know you can do with that file after the fact. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. is this a file that I can deconvolve and pull information out? Um, good example of that are the people here that are working with where we're looking at 3D time lapse of mitochondrial function. So yeah. we have to get um, I think we're only doing eight minute movies now where they're doing a stack of images, no more than 20 slices. Um, and we have to get through that entire stack in less than one second. So it's got to go fast. So if you think about all the things that we did that brought that original data set up to an hour to get through the stack, obviously you're not going to do that with a live cell. So mm -hmm. you have to counter you know, I can't, I can't hit these cells with too much light. Um, I can't make them so noisy that I can't see what's there. I have to use a resonant scanner, which is 8,000 hertz versus a regular scanner, which is 600 hertz. Um, mm -hmm. I can't do any averaging. I can't do any accumulation because those take time. I can't do any um, sequence. Uh, I'll have to deal with uh, um, dye separation after the fact. There's all these things that I know I can do afterwards to what looks visually to be a horrible file. So one of the things that you discover uh, in here, I'm going to share the screen again just for a quick second because I want to show you. Um, you know, just cancel that for a second. Oh. Shoot. OK, um, is you look at this image that we see right now. Let me go back to acquire just to make sure you see this image right here and you compare it to. I got to get sorry, that other one was a single slice. There we go. So like this one right here. So look at this image right now. And this is the original image without doing even that little bit of blurring that I did before. Now, what can you see? You can see that there are blue nuclei. You can see that some of the cells have red. You can see one has green. You can see that there's some yellowish color in the middle where there must be a little bit of red and a little bit of green. You're not really sure. We need to do some higher end analysis to separate those. But visually, if I look at that, and I make it even actual size. So right now, this is larger than actual size. This is actual size right here, okay? So you look at all that and you say, okay, I can see that. And this was captured at 512 by 512 pixels, okay? Now you compare that to this image right here. Now, does this look better? Look a little bit. It's a little smoother, right? A little more detail. But if all you're looking for is, are there nuclei? Are there red cells? Are there green cells? Are there, is there some overlapping areas? You're getting the same exact information, right? So it's a question of at what level of resolution do you need that differentiation? Um, if I'm looking at a macro level, like this whole blob of cells, I'm seeing the same thing at 1024 that I'm seeing at 512. And that means that I can get it done in half the time if I only need to shoot at 512. So, so there's, there's a left half of mm -hmm. the brain and a right half of the brain when it comes to doing these images. As a photographer, I'm always thinking, which, is, which side is which? Left side is artistic, right side is analytical, or is it the other way around? I never remember. Which I think is, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so as a photographer, I always want a nice, beautiful, good, high quality looking image. But as a scientist, you go for what gives you the data. And mm -hmm. sometimes what gives you the data looks like crap. All right. But you know you can get the data out of it. Mm -hmm. And so you compromise up the wazoo to do that. So those uh, time lapse movies that we do of the mitochondria look horrible. You, you couldn't separate the mitochondria. But after we do deconvolution uh, and some separation techniques, those things look just as nice and smooth and 3D as these things do. Yeah, um, so excellent. knowing that I can do that, I can compromise on what my settings are to speed things up.
So long-winded okay. answer, sorry. That's okay. The other other question on science is that the research that they're doing, is it is it basic research? It's cancer. I know you're doing some cancer research. You know, what what is it used for? So Wistar uh, concentrates on three things mainly. So cancer research is the major function that we do here. Um, but then we also deal with uh, uh, immunology, uh, basic immunology and vaccine development. Um, most of what I'm working on is cancer stuff. Uh, and when you say cancer stuff, it's pretty much every kind of cancer you can think of. Everything right. from melanoma. We have one of the largest melanoma labs in the country. Um, but, you know, melanoma, breast cancer, uh, brain cancer, prostate cancer, um, ovarian cancer, a lot of, uh, you know, those kind of things. Um, okay. So, yeah, pancreatic. Yeah, I think I did some stuff with that once, too. Uh, so yeah. it just kind of depends on what the researcher is working on. Um, and there's a lot of assays that kind of go across the board. They're going to take different imaging modalities, different, different ways of imaging their, their, uh, um, their samples and combining them to tell a story. So if they come to me and they say, okay, I need a confocal way of seeing three-dimensional uh, images through a dividing uh, cell where I can see the telomeres on the tips of right. every chromosome, I can do that, right? So okay. it's not easy, but I can do that. Um, and oh, hey, I can show you an image actually. Go back Brian to share screen. Question. Yeah, what's your other question? Ahead, well, my Brian. question is, say you take the image that you're just describing. Uh-huh. How much does that image cost to produce? Ah, that's that's where you get into a big question, right? All right, here. Yeah. Gonna, so, just out of curiosity, you know, <laughs> if you have to ask, you can't afford it. Yeah, basically. No, no. that's no. Seriously, because. No. So, so let me stop. So, so the way we charge, I've got to stop this thing from previewing. There we go. Uh, turn off the movie editor. Um, we charge for time on the instrument and our time uh, working with the people. Now, once they've been fully trained and they can do it by themselves, they're only paying for the time on the instrument, which is about $40 an hour. Um, now that's subsidized. So uh, basically, if you're a Wistar researcher, it's $40 an hour. Uh, but if you are an external um, but still academic person, um, it's going to be um, 50 percent higher than that. And if you are a uh, commercial person, it's going to be, I think, three times higher than that. So um, you know, we have basically three different tiers. So in the end, then, it just depends how long does it take to do what you're asking to. Now, let me come back here. What I'm trying to get here is, I don't know if you can see my 3, 3D dividing cell here. Yeah, I see it. Okay. And you can see the little chromosomes. Well, you, you mm -hmm. yeah, there's no telomeres on the tips of those chromosomes. But that's the kind of resolution that sometimes we would need. A telomere would be like a little dot at the end of one of these things. Mm-hmm. So that is, it is possible to get to that level. Um, and to answer, to answer your question, Karna, in a non-flippant way, it's generally going to be about $1,000 to train somebody. Uh, and then it's going to be, again, $40 an hour for them to work with the instrument. Now, how much help they need from us mm -hmm. depends on how good they are. Um, yeah. We have people that need me here with them the entire time. So they're paying $55 an hour for me plus $40 an hour for the microscope. So $95 an hour to get their work done. Um, what you saw here was one blob, one cell, something like that. If you need yeah. statistics and you need to get um, data from 100 cells, you're not going to do it this way. You know, so we talk about what their needs are and what other ways we have of acquiring things in a higher, um, higher mm -hmm. throughput, higher um, number of cells. You know, there are other approaches to get the, the quantitation uh, that they need. Okay, yeah, that's, that gives me a general idea, just. Yeah, I will say thanks again to Jamie and 
Thank you. We appreciate everybody being here for this. Spread the word.